The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14. Visit element14.com forward slash TBHS to learn how a purchase of $100 or more can get you a free subscription to Make Magazine while supplies last. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. Got an idea you'd like to see built? Why not send it to the Ben Heck Show? Hello, and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to be building a pinball machine. We'll start by installing a new CNC machine in my shop. We can use this to cut out the parts. Then we'll work on the design, which will include useful tips for your own CAD CAM projects. By the way, CAD CAM stands for Computer Aided Design, Computer Aided Manufacturing. Finally, we'll discuss how to use an embedded processor to control everything. If you've been interested in embedded processors in the past, this will be a great introduction to their use. Enough talk, let's get started. Here's the ShopBot CNC machine I ordered. It comes in a crate, some assembly required. This should be easy. Most of the parts are either structural or electronic in nature. As we discussed in episode two, a CNC machine is fairly simple. It's the software to run it that's complicated. Some assemblies come pre-built, such as this Y-axis arm. Most of the construction time involves putting the table together and keeping it square. The Y-axis arm is a fixed size with rollers on the end, so we've got to make sure the sides of our table are parallel so it'll all fit together. Three layers of material are used to create the work table. Now we've got to get everything up and running. One of the biggest dangers with CNC is the machine damaging itself or the routing bits. So we take everything slowly, first doing air cuts before actually cutting material. Now can you uh, do one on all four corners and Put in three more holes on there. Yeah. And have a big, 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 just to see if it fits yeah. the table. Okay, have an air drill. Make the same one in four inches from each corner. Oh, got it, got it. I'm getting ready to actually cut some material. Our next step is to cut poles in all four corners of the table to make sure that the machine can operate at its full four by eight foot size. The top layer of MDF board is the sacrificial material, the work surface that will get banged up along the way. We have the machine drill countersink holes into this. That way, when we put the screws in to secure the table, the heads of the screws will be deep below the surface, so we won't hit them with the bit later on by accident. We do another pass to put small guide holes inside the bigger ones, then it's time to screw everything down. There's a casualty along the way though. The fan blades on my favorite drill just blow up out of nowhere. No. The table is now securely fastened, and even if the bit digs into it a little, it won't hit the screws since they've been countersunk. We then test out the 3D functions of the machine by carving out a small replica of a Porsche. Not wanting to bore my friends to death, I do the next part later on by myself, surfacing the table. Wood is rarely completely flat, so the machine skims off a thin layer to make it flat. This process takes forever, so I work on a customer's single-handed controller in the meantime. Now that the CNC machine is up and working, we can work on the cabinet designs themselves. We have our basic pinball design. However, this one is not at the right rotation. The machines are actually tilted forward a little bit at about exactly negative 3.5 degrees like that, which makes the legs level down there at the bottom. So the new thing that we're going to try is having folding legs. Now it might not be entirely obvious from this drawing, but here's one of the new pinball legs. And inside the unit is going to be some square tubing and the leg will slide out of the tubing like this, and then it will rotate on a hinge, or a pin, which will be right there, and then finally, it'll fold up under the unit. So the bottom leg goes the back one goes Now you might be thinking, oh, but the legs are gonna hit each other, right? Wrong. If you look at the back of the unit, we have another line drawing here. You can see the back leg is going to drop down and then slide over. Your back leg will do this. It'll come down, it'll come in a little bit, go up, and then the run in front will just come up and they'll sit side by side. So what we're doing here is we're making the machine fit within a small area. So 
You can select all this stuff here. We see that it'll fit in uh, under 27 inches of height. So I think it'll work out pretty good. So uh, the next thing to do is to actually route out this sucker. The CNC machine is controlled by a laptop via USB. Currently, this laptop is sitting on a table, which is fairly inconvenient. I have to go over to it, sit down, type stuff, select OK, blah, blah, blah. However, this laptop must be attached to the machine at all times as it sends commands and codes line by line. My solution was to design and route a rolling computer desk, which can hold the laptop, mouse pad, and power supply. I can type on it standing up and roll it closer to the machine when doing calibrations. It may look like something out of Skyball, but it fits my needs perfectly. All right, let's all put together. I have a rolling table with which to move the computer around for controlling the CNC machine. Now, on the pinball. We're almost ready to route. We're using a program called Partworks, which is also sometimes called VCar, to generate the file to control the machine. And we're going to use two basic tools. An eighth inch bit to drill the holes for the screws and some of the connection points. Then, a quarter inch bit to do the main cutouts around the edges. Let's preview all tool paths to see what it's going to do to route out this pinball machine. There's the screw holes, there's the um, notches to slide boards into, there's the inner holes such as air vents and the coin door, here's where the glass goes, and then there's the shapes themselves. Bam! Done! Three points! Swish! It takes about an hour to cut out all the parts, but they do fit on a single 4x8 piece of MDO plywood. MDO is medium density overlay and has a solid paper coating on each side, instead of wood grain. A friend of mine suggested using it since we'll be covering everything with graphics anyway. We talked about sliding legs earlier, now we're routing the brackets for them. The end caps have grooves which help us align the pieces for easy assembly and also add strength. These brackets hold the square aluminum tubing that the legs will slide in and out of. We drill two holes in each aluminum tube and then secure it to the wooden bracket with machine screws. Now we'll show an example of how the legs go in the cabinet. All right, so here's the tubing that the legs are gonna fit in. So this is a misengineering bit right there. So the leg slides up into the tube like this and there's gonna be a stop. And then as you can see, there's a slot on the leg. So what happens is this comes out like this. <clears throat> in theory. <laughs> Yes, okay. Then it rotates so it can fold up under the cabinet, just like that. It would seem that in true Ben fashion, I made my tolerances too tight. So to compensate for that, I have the tolerance compensation tool. Another engineering job well done. Well, there you have it. We designed, routed, and assembled a pinball machine cabinet. In future episodes, we'll come back and take a look at this build to see how it's progressing. As I mentioned earlier, we won't be able to finish the entire pinball machine in this episode, but we will get started on the programming which makes it tick, using an embedded processor. Our sponsors Element 14 now carry a very popular type of embedded processor called the Arduino board. At the Element 14 store, you can choose from Arduino Nano, Mega, and Uno boards. This, for instance, is a Mega board. The difference between them is the amount of features and memory they have. They're great for doing embedded projects where you want to sense or control the environment, such as robotics, RFID readers, or perhaps even a pinball machine. Plus, the development environment is completely open source, so you can do it on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Check out all the new Arduino boards at element14.com and check out element14.com forward slash TBHS for details on how you can get a free subscription to Make Magazine while supplies last. This offer is only good in the United States, but you can check the site for other promotions in your region. Now let's talk about using embedded processors for this and other applications. Something large like a pinball machine could be controlled with a PC, but if you're making a smaller device, a large, power-hungry PC isn't the best option, or even an option at all. That's when you turn to embedded processors. You get the logic of a computer, yet the small size of an integrated circuit. One popular platform is the Arduino. It's an open source development environment around Atmel's line of AT Mega processors. Once you buy an Arduino board, you can download the software and tutorials to run it at www.arduino.cc. I'm also a fan of the Parallax Propeller Processor, which I used on my Bill Paxton pinball machine. It has eight internal processors, which allow you to do very easy multitasking, though the RAM is kind of limited. It can also output video, which can be useful for debugging. You can download their software at www.parallax.com. 
Let's look at three examples of what you can do with these processors, input, output, and sound. Remember, these basics can be applied to all sorts of projects. I just want to get your creative juices flowing. For my input example, I'll be using something we're all familiar with, a Nintendo 8-bit controller. Ever notice how it has 8 buttons but only 7 pins on the plug? How can that work? The answer is a shift register. The controller contains a shift register, which is an integrated circuit that converts parallel inputs, such as buttons, to serial data. The CPU sends a pulse on the latch line. This gets the button states into the register and ready to go. The CPU then pulses the clock line 8 times, each pulse retrieving a bit from the register. Bam bam! Bam bam! Bam bam bam! Bam! The byte has now been transferred. Let's take a look at this in practice with the NES controller. Here's a little demonstration. We've got our Nintendo controller, and it's shifting its bits into this. And it's quite simple. We have up, down, left, right, select, start, B, A. So, yeah, the controller basically fits into one byte of data, and that's how the Nintendo reads it, and that's how you can read a shift register. Now, it might not seem that useful to only read 8 bits or 1 byte from a shift register, but what you can do is put them in series, like in this drawing. So basically what happens is as you shift out the bits from one shift register, it shifts them into the next shift register, kind of like a centipede. So you could have four shift registers in a row, and that would actually get you 32 bits out the end. And you can actually daisy chain as many together as you want, within reason. It just depends on the speed of accessing it with your program. So you know, if you had like 10,000 shift registers, obviously it would take a longer time to shift out that data than one shift register. But with a high-speed processor, you can daisy train quite a few together and still get the data out pretty quickly. Therefore, giving yourself many more inputs than you have on your processor itself, or outputs as well. You can use a shift register for an output in the same way, just reversed. The CPU has a number ready and sends eight clock pulses to put this data onto the shift register. When the CPU pulses the latch line, the data appears on the outputs and can light LEDs, trigger relays, or whatever you want. Here's a parallax propeller. I put this little board together myself. But basically you've got the CPU, a crystal to drive the clock, and an EEPROM to load the program, and then a little 3.3 uh, volt power regulator. So what happens is you can hook up some power, I think that's like 12 volts, then it goes into the circuit, and then that's all there is to it, basically. So we've also got this thing over here, which is um, some SD cards. And with all these embedded processes, you can go on the internet and find libraries, such as a library that allows you to access the data on an SD card. It's pretty handy, and you know, most of this stuff has usually already been figured out. So once you find the libraries, you're good to go. So then we've also got our little audio plug here, which looks like a mess, because it is. Then finally, we've got this USB to serial adapter. Um, typically, any of these embedded processes will be programmed via USB, and usually the plug will be on the board itself. In the case of this one, there's not much circuitry here, so I had to buy this external adapter to make it work. But there we go, right there, it's ready to program, so now let's move on to the program. Let's start by putting an audio clip on the SD card. I have my SoundForge 4 program here, which I think is the oldest program I still use. I don't know why I still use this, I just I just do. Uh, heavy traffic, why not? SoundForge 4 is thinking, kill me. Look, it still works. Okay, great. So we'll just make that a file. Then we need to make sure it's the right format to work on the SD card with the uh, propeller. So we're just gonna call this traffic. And we want to make sure it's 44,100 hertz, which is 44,100 samples per second. 16-bit stereo, okay. Also known as CD quality. Okay, so the SD card with the data, we'll hook it up into the little processor. And the processor is hooked up to my stereo, so when the song comes through, we can hear it. Now we need to do the program. This is the propeller tool. It's the development environment for the propeller processor. You can download it off their site. Or if you're using an Arduino, they have their own development right here, and again, it's the same thing. You use a little program, you write out your code, and there's plenty of samples on the internet to get you started. You write out your code, and then you upload it to your integrated circuit, and then it executes. So let's go back to the propeller here. 
um, I found an object which plays music off an SD card. So it's all, all the work is pretty much done for us here. We just have to check a few things. The pins that it outputs on that we hooked up the um, headphone jack to, we have to make sure that's correct. We're gonna actually use pin 16 and 17, right? We go back up here. Here's the first thing it does. So SD mount zero, which means we're going to mount the SD card that is attached to pin zero through three. And then there's a routine here called play. And so all we do is we, need to, we just need to call that the main routine. So we go play and then our parameters, which is a string, which has the file name, which was traffic wave, as you might recall. Switch on the repeller and hit compile. Sends it and it's kind of an overmodulated sound clip, but uh, as you can hear, it's uh, playing off the chip. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Join us in the next episode as we build solar powered and kinetic powered chargers for some portable devices, such as the power hungry Android. We'll see you then. The Ben Heck Show is made possible by our sponsors at Element 14. For more information on all my projects and for a list of all the parts I use today, visit element14.com. We'll see you next time.